Hello everyone. This is Vaseem from Edureka and I welcome you all to this session in which I'm going to discuss the top 50 dotnet interview questions. So let's take a look at the agenda for this session. First I will discuss the basic interview questions and then I will move on to intermediate and then advanced level interview questions in the end. I hope you guys are clear with the agenda. Also don't forget to subscribe to Edureka for more exciting tutorials and also press the bell icon to get the latest updates from Edureka. Now without wasting any more time, let's start the beginner level interview questions for dotnet. So let's take a look at the first question. The very first question is what is dotnet framework? So the dotnet framework is a software development platform developed by Microsoft and the framework was meant to create applications which would run on the Windows platform and the first version of the dotnet framework was released in the year 2002. The framework also supports various programming languages like Visual Basic and C Sharp. So the developers can actually choose this and select the language to develop the required application. The dotnet framework consists of the common language runtime and the dotnet framework class library. The common language runtime is the foundation of the dotnet framework and ASP.NET works directly with the runtime to enable ASP.NET apps and XML services, both of which are discussed later. So this is about dotnet framework guys. Let's move on to the next question. The next question is what are different components of dotnet? So following other different components of dotnet guys, it is common language runtime, application domain, common type system, dotnet class library, dotnet framework and profiling. Let's talk about all these different components in detail now. So first of all, let's talk about common language runtime. The common language runtime or CLR is the virtual machine component of Microsoft's dotnet framework. It manages the execution of dotnet programs and just in time compilation converts the managed code which is the compiled intermediate language code and into the machine instructions which are then executed on the CPU of the computer. Now talking about the application domain application domain is nothing but one logical region where dotnet runtime runs and executes code. It provides security and isolation for executing managed code and we can use application domain to isolate any task that might bring down process. Talking about common type system, the common type system or CTS is a standard that specifies how type definitions and specific values of types are represented in computer memory. It is intended to allow programs written in different programming languages to easily share information. Talking about a .NET class library, the framework class library is a comprehensive collection of reusable types including classes, interfaces and data types that include the .NET frameworks to provide access to system functionality. The .NET FCL forms the base on which applications, controls and components are built in .NET. Then there is the .NET framework and talking about profiling, .NET profilers are a developer's best friend when it comes to optimizing applications performance. They are especially critical when doing low level CPU and memory optimizations. Application performance management or APM tools are designed to monitor production servers. So these are the components or the different components of dotnet that I have discussed. Let's take a look at the next question now. Third question is what do you know about CTS? In Microsoft dotnet framework the common type system or CTS is a standard that specifies how type definitions and specific values of types are represented in computer memory. It is intended to allow programs written in different programming languages to easily share information. Let's take a look at the next question guys. The next question is what is CLR? So CLR which actually stands for common language runtime is an important component of the dotnet framework. We can use CLR as a building block of various applications and provide a secure execution environment for applications. Whenever an application which is written in C sharp is compiled, the code is converted into an intermediate language and after this the code is targeted to CLR which then performs several operations like memory management, security checks, loading assemblies and thread management as well. So this is about CLR which is also known as common language runtime guys. So let's take a look at the next question now. Question 5 says you have to explain CLS. So what exactly is CLS? CLS stands for common language specification and it is a subset of CTS which is common type system. It defines a set of rules and restrictions that every language must follow which runs under the .NET framework. The languages which follows these set of rules are said to be CLS compliant. Let's take a look at the next question guys. Question number 6 says what do you know about JIT? So JIT is a compiler which stands for just in type compiler and it is used to convert the intermediate code into the native languages. 
during the execution the intermediate code is converted into the native language so this is the work of JIT or just in time compiler guys. Let's take a look at the next question now question number seven says why do we use response dot output dot write so we use response dot output dot write to get the formatted output. So this is basically used to get the formatted output. This is a very basic question guys which you actually encounter during an interview. So now that we know how we can use response dot output dot write. Let's talk about formatted output. Actually formatted output converts the internal binary representation of the data to ASCII which is ASCII characters which are written to the output file formatted input reads character from the input file and converts them into the internal form. So this is about the formatted output that we can actually get using the response dot output dot write method. So let's take a look at the next question which says what is the difference between response redirect and server dot transfer. So response dot redirect basically redirects the user's browser to another page or site. The history of the user's browser is updated to reflect the new address as well. I mean it also performs a trip back to the client where the client's browser is redirected to the new page. Whereas server dot transfer actually transfer from one page to the other without making any round trip back to the client. And the history does not get updated in the case of a server dot transfer. So this is the basic difference between response dot redirect and server dot transfer guys. So let's take a look at the next question now. The next question is difference between managed and unmanaged code. So the resource which is within your application domain that is the managed code. The resources that are within domain are faster and the code which is developed in .NET framework is also known as a managed code and this code is directly executed by CLR with the help of managed code execution. Any language that is written in .NET framework is managed code. Also managed code uses a CLR which in turn looks after your applications by managing memory handling security allowing cross language debugging and so on. So let's talk about unmanaged code now the code which is developed outside the .NET framework is known as unmanaged code applications that do not run under the control of the CLR are said to be unmanaged and certain languages such as C++ can be used to write such applications. For example access low level functions of the operating system background compatibility with code of visual basics ASP and examples of unmanaged code unmanaged code can be unmanaged source code and unmanaged compiled code as well and last but not the least unmanaged code is executed with the help of a wrapper class wrapper classes are of two types CCW that is COM callable wrapper and RCW which is known as runtime callable wrapper. So this is about the difference between managed and unmanaged code guys. So let's take a look at the next question which is the difference between classes and objects. So a class is a construct that defines a collection of properties and methods in a single unit which does not change during the execution of a program. Whereas objects are created and eventually destroyed during the execution of a program. So they only live in the program for a short time while objects are living their attributes may be changed at the execution of a program. Every objects belong to a class and every class contains one or more related objects. This is a very obvious point guys and that means a class is created once and object is created from the same class many times as they require. There is no memory space allocation for a class when it is created while memory space is allocated for an object when it is created. So this is about the difference between classes and objects. Let's move on to the next question. It says what do you know about boxing and unboxing. So boxing is a procedure of converting a value type to an object type. Hence the value type is stored on the stack and the object type is stored in the heap memory. This conversion of the value type to the object type is an implicit conversion. You can directly assign a value to an object and C sharp will handle the rest conversion. Talking about unboxing the reverse of boxing is unboxing. I mean unboxing is a conversion of the object type to the value type. In unboxing the value of box object type stored on the heap is transferred to the value type that is stored on the stack. Unlike boxing the unboxing has to be done explicitly. The object type is explicitly cast to the value type and the value type must be same as value the object type is referring to. So this is about boxing and unboxing guys. Let's talk about the next question which is the difference between constants and read only variables. So constants are static by default and read only variables must have set value by the time constructor exits. Constants must have a value at compilation time. You can have for example 3.14 into 2 plus 5 but cannot call methods. 
and read only variables are evaluated when instance is created a constant could be a declared within functions but you can use static modifier for read only fields now talking about the next point constants are copied into every assembly that uses them and every assembly gets a local copy of the values but read only modifier for the read only variables can be used only for instance or static fields you cannot use read only keyword for variables in the methods so these are the differences between constants and read only variables let's take a look at the next question guys the next question is what is bcl so bcl is the base class library of classes interfaces and value types it provides functionality like threading input output security diagnostics resources globalization etc it is a foundation of dotnet framework applications components and controls a bcl encapsulates a huge number of common functions and make them easily available for the developers it also provides namespaces that are used very frequently for example system system dot activities etc and it also serves the purpose of interaction between the user and runtime so this is all about bcl guys which is a base class library so the next question is what are the different versions of dotnet framework the very first version was 1.0 and it goes until 2.0 to 7.0 so the first version which is the dotnet framework 1.0 and 1.1 was actually visual studio dotnet 2002 then came a dotnet framework 2.0 which was the part of visual studio 2005 and so on we have dotnet framework 3.0 slash 3.5 then we have dotnet core which was a part of the visual studio 2017 so these are the different versions of dotnet framework so let's take a look at the next question now the next question is what is the difference between namespace and assembly an assembly is a physical grouping of logical units whereas namespace groups classes so this is a very basic difference between namespace and assembly also a namespace can span multiple assemblies as well so this is where it goes between namespace and assembly let's take a look at the next question guys which is what exactly is link l i n q which stands for language integrated query pronounced as link and it is a dotnet language extension that supports data retrieval from different data sources like xml document databases and collections it was introduced in the dotnet 3.5 framework and visual basic and c sharp are the languages that have link capabilities so this is all about link guys let's take a look at the next question which is what exactly is msil so msil stands for microsoft intermediate language and during the compile time the compiler convert the source code into the microsoft intermediate language which is msil and then the microsoft intermediate language is a cpu independent set of instructions that can be efficiently converted to the native code so this is how we use msil in dotnet so let's take a look at the next question which is from which base class all web forms are inherited now this is a very basic question and interviewer may ask you because the answer for this is very common and the answer is all web forms are inherited from page class so you don't have to be confused while you are being asked this question just be confident and answer this now that we are done with the beginner level interview questions let's move on to intermediate level interview questions and take a look at the first one the first question is explain different parts of assembly so the first part is manifest it has the information about the version of the assembly then we have type metadata which actually contains the binary information of the program that you have written and then comes the msil which i have just talked about which is a microsoft intermediate language code which actually has cpu independent uh, set of instructions that can be efficiently converted to the native code and then we have resources which have a list of all the related files for your assembly so this is all about different parts of assembly let's take a look at the next question so it says how do you prevent a class from being inherited so the answer is pretty simple guys we can use the seal keyword to prevent a class from being inherited this is also again a very tricky questions when you're being asked in an interview so be calm and answer this confidently now that we're done with this question let's take a look at the next one so the next question is what are the different types of constructors in c sharp so following other constructors in c sharp guys which is a default constructor then there is parameterized a copy constructor a static constructor and a private constructor so there is a very thin line between all these constructors i'm sure you must be knowing what is a default constructor and then if you pass some parameters there is a parameterized constructor and rest goes on with these so you are just being asked what are the different types you have to be very precise when you're answering questions 
don't you know over optimize and give something extra to the interviewer. So now that we know what are different types of constructors that are there in the C sharp. Let's talk about them one by one in detail. A constructor with no parameters is called a default constructor and a default constructor has every instance of the class to be initialized to the same values. The default constructor initializes all numeric fields to zero and all string and object fields to null inside the class. Now talking about the parameterized constructor a constructor have at least one parameter then it is called a parameterized constructor. It can initialize each instance of the class to different values coming on to copy constructor. This constructor creates an object by copying variables from another object. Its main use is to initialize a new instance to the values of an existing instance. Talking about a static constructor a static constructor has to be invoked only once in the class and it has been invoked during the creation of the first reference to a static member in the class. A static constructor is initialized static fields or data of the class and to be executed only once. There are certain points to remember while using static constructor. The first one is it cannot be called directly then when it is executing then the user has no control and then it does not take any access modifiers or any parameters as well. And last but not the least it is called automatically to initialize the class before the first instance is created. Now talking about a private constructor if a constructor is created with private specifier it is known as a private constructor. It is not possible for other classes to derive from this class and also it's not possible to create an instance of this class. There are also a certain points to remember while using a private constructor. It is the implementation of a singleton class pattern and use private constructor when we have only static members. And then last but not the least using a private constructor it prevents the creation of the instances of that class. So this is all about the constructors in C sharp. Let's talk about the next question that we have. The next question is what are the different types of assemblies. So the different type of assemblies are private assembly and shared assembly. So let's talk about private assembly. Private assembly is only accessible to the application and it is installed in the installation directory of the application. Talking about the shared assembly it can be shared by multiple applications and it is installed in the GAC. So this is all about the different types of assemblies. Let's talk about the next question which says what are MDI and SDI. So MDI is a multiple document interface and SDI is single document interface and MDI lets you open multiple windows but an SDI it opens each document in a separate window. Now MDI will have one parent window and as many child windows as it wants and the components are shared from the parent window like a menu bar toolbar etc. But for the SDI each window has its own components like menu bar toolbar etc. And therefore it is not constrained to the parent window. So these are the basic differences between you know MDI and SDI with their definition of course. So let's take a look at the next question which says what are the differences between custom control and user control. A custom control is a loosely coupled uh, control defined in a class which derives from control. But the base user control is nothing but a custom control that you derive to create a control user interface specific to your application. The UI of the custom control is generally defined in a resource dictionary inside the resource file and they are created according to the requirement of the business and if you want to change the functionality of existing controls such as a button or a label you can directly derive the new class with these existing classes and can change their default behavior. We can also create teams for a custom control and reuse it in various projects very easily. Now coming on to user control it provides the reusability of design and are created in the same way as a web form. They have an dot ASCX extension and user controls are quite helpful if they have to be used only for a particular website. Now they have a visual interface. These controls are loaded at runtime so they cannot be found in the toolbox. And they offer an easy way to partition and reuse common user interfaces across ASP.NET web applications. They also use the same web forms programming model on which web forms page normally works. So these are the differences between custom and user control. So let's take a look at the next question guys. What is garbage collector? Automatic memory management is made possible by garbage collection in .NET framework. Now when a class object is created at runtime. Certain memory space is allocated to it in the heap memory. However, after all the actions related to the object are completed, 
the memory space allocated to it is a waste as it cannot be used. So in this case garbage collection is a very useful as it automatically releases the memory after it is no longer required. So the heap memory is organized into three generations so that various objects with different lifetimes can be handled appropriately during the garbage collection. The memory of each generation will be given by the common language runtime which is CLR depending on the project size internally optimization engine will call the collection means method to select which object will go into generation 1 or generation 2. So generation 0 actually store the shorted objects and then generation 1 stores the medium lived objects while generation 2 actually stores long lived objects. So this is about garbage collection in dotnet framework guys. So let's take a look at the next question which says what is caching? Caching simply means storing the data temporarily in the memory so that the data can be accessed from the memory instead of searching for it in the original location and it increases the efficiency of the application and also increases the speed as well. So following are the types of caching we have which is page caching data caching and fragment caching. Now that we know what caching is let's talk about the different type of caching that we have which is page caching data caching and fragment caching. Page caching is another method which can help you improve the load time of your web pages and thus optimize your site for the search engines. A page load time can significantly impact your user experience and also your site's ability to convert the visitors into buyers or into leads. Now talking about data caching, caching is a technique of storing frequently used data or information in memory so that when the same data or information is needed the next time it could be directly retrieved from the memory instead of being generated by the application. So this is where data caching is used. Now talking about a fragment caching. Fragment caching is actually referring to the caching of individual user controls within a web form. Each user control can have independent cache durations and implementations of how the caching behavior is to be applied. Fragment caching is useful when you need the cache only a subset of a page. So this is all about caching guys. Let's move on to the next question which says explain MVC. So what exactly is MVC? MVC stands for model view controller which is an architecture to build dotnet applications. Let's talk about model. So model basically are logical part of any application that handles object storage and retrieval from the databases from an application. Talking about a view view handles the UI part of an application which is the user interface. So they get the information from the models for their display. Talking about the controller they handle the user interactions figure out the responses from the user input and also render the view that is required for the user interaction. So this is all about MVC architecture. Let's take a look at the next question which is what is CAS. So CAS actually stands for code access security. CAS is a part of a security model that prevents unauthorized access to the resources. It also enables the users to get permissions for the code. I mean CLR then executes the code depending upon the permissions. CAS can only be used for managed code. So the program has to be written in the dotnet framework. So if an assembly uses CAS it is treated as partially trusted and although it goes through checks each time an assembly tries to access the resources. So this is all about CAS or code access security. So let's take a look at the next question which is explain localization and globalization. So globalization is the process of designing the application in such a way that it can be used by the users from across the globe. And localization on the other hand is the process of customization to make our applications behave as per the current culture or locale. So this is all about globalization and localization. So let's take a look at the next question which is what is application domain. So ASP.NET introduces a concept of application domain or app domain which is how we say it and it is like a lightweight process that acts both like a boundary and a container. The .NET runtime uses the app domain as a container for data and code and after that the CLR allows multiple .NET applications to run in a single app domain. So this is all about application domain. So let's take a look at the next question which says what is delegate in .NET? A delegate in .NET is similar to a function pointer in other programming languages like C or C++ and a delegate allows the users to encapsulate the reference of a method in a delegate object. Now talking about the delegate object it can then be passed into a program which will call the reference method that we have referenced to a delegate object 
and we can use the delegate method to create a custom event in a class so this is how we use delegate in dotnet so let's take a look at the next question now which is what is the difference between an abstract class and an interface in dotnet now talking about an abstract class an abstract class provides a partial implementation for a functionality that must be implemented by the inheriting entities and an interface mainly declares a contract or behavior that is being implementing the classes that should have now an abstract class declares fields too but an interface may declare only properties methods and events with no access modifier so this is the basic difference or the main difference between abstract class and interface in dotnet so let's take a look at the next question now which is the difference between a stack and a heap so stack is used for static memory allocation and heap for dynamic memory allocation for both are stored in the computer's ram variables are allocated on the heap have their memory allocated at runtime and accessing this memory is a bit slower but the heap size is only limited by the size of virtual memory so these are the differences between stack and a heap the main differences let's take a look at the next question which is what are the different validators in asp.net there is client side validation and server side validation so let's talk about client side validation first so when the validation is taking place on the client side browser it is called client side validation usually javascript is used for client side validation and talking about server side validation now when the validation is taking place on the server it is called the server side validation now server side validation is considered as a secure form of validation because even if the user has bypassed the client side validation we can still catch it in the server side validation so these are the different validations in asp.net which is client side validation and server side validation now that we have discussed client side validation and server side validations i want to discuss the validation controls that we have for asp.net so we have a required field validator which actually ensures that the required field is not empty and it is generally tied to a text box to force input into the text box then we have a range validator the range validator control verifies that the input value falls within a predetermined range now talking about the next one is compared validator the compare validator control compares a value in one control with a fixed value or a value in another control then there is regular expression validator which says the regular expression validator allows validating the input text by matching against a pattern of a regular expression the regular expression is set in the validation expression property and then there is custom validator as well the custom validator control allows writing application specific custom validation routines for both the client side and server side validation as well the client side validation is accomplished through the client validation function property the client side validation routine should be written in a scripting language which i've already told you that is javascript or visual basic script that is also known as vb script which the browser can understand and the server side validation routine must be called from the controls server validate event handler the server side validation routine should be written in any dotnet language like c sharp or vb.net then there is validation summary as well so the validation summary control does not perform any validation but shows a summary of all the errors in the page the summary displays the values of the error message property of all validation controls that failed validation now the following two mutually inclusive properties list out the error message which is show summary and show message box so the show summary actually shows the error in which the message is in a specified format and show message box shows the error messages in a separate window now that we are done with the intermediate questions let's move on to the advanced level interview questions so let's take a look at the first question which says what are exe and dll in dotnet so exe and dll are assembly executable modules talking about exe it is an executable file that runs the application for which it is designed when we build an application the exe file is generated therefore the assemblies are loaded directly when we run an exe file but an exe file cannot be shared with other application so this is a minor setback for a exe file now talking about dll it stands for dynamic link library that consists of code that needs to be hidden the code is encapsulated in this library because we are talking about hiding the content so we are encapsulating the code in the library and an application can have many dlls and also can be shared with other applications as well so this is all about exe and dll 
So let's talk about the next question, which is what is the difference between a function and a stored procedure? So in a scalar function, you can only return one variable and in a stored procedure multiple variables. However, to call the output variables in a stored procedure, it is necessary to declare variables outside the procedure to invoke it. So function actually returns only a single value and a stored procedure can perform specific task only. It is always used to perform a specific task. So these are the differences between function and a stored procedure. Let's take a look at the next question. So the next question is list the events in the page lifecycle. So following are the events that are involved in a page lifecycle. The first one is page pre init then page init then we have page init complete then there is page preload there is page load and then there is page load complete last but not least we have a render. Let's talk about the events in the page lifecycle one by one. First of all, we'll talk about pre init. So let's talk about a few points that it covers. So first of all, it actually checks the is post back property to determine whether this is the first time the page is being processed and then it create or recreate the dynamic controls. After this the pre init event will set a master page dynamically and after that it will set the theme property dynamically as well. Now talking about the next event which is in it. First of all this event fires after each control has been initialized. After that each controls unique ID is set and any skin settings have been applied. After this in it will use this event to read or initialize control properties and finally the init event is fired first for the bottom most control in the hierarchy and then fired up the hierarchy until it is fired for the page itself. Now talking about init complete first of all until now the view state values are not yet loaded. Hence you can use this event to make changes to the view state and that you want to ensure are persisted after the next post back. Then you have to raise the page object. After this, this event will process the tasks that require all the initialization to be complete. Now talking about preload, it is raised after the page loads view state for itself and all controls and after it processes post back data that is included with the request instance. Now before the page instance raises this event, it loads view state for itself and all controls and then processes any post back data included with the request instance. After this loads view state, I mean view state data are loaded to controls and after this post back data are now handed to the page controls. Now talking about the load event, the page object called the onload method on the page object and then recursively does the same for each child control until the page and all controls are loaded. The load event of the individual controls occurs after the load event of the page. This is the first place in the page lifecycle that all values are restored. Most of the code checks the value of is post back to avoid unnecessarily resetting state. And you may also call validate to check the value of is valid in this method as well. And you can also create dynamic controls in this method and use the onload event method to set properties in controls and establish a database connection. Now talking about load complete, it is raised at the end of the event handling stage and use this event for tasks that require that all the other controls on the page to be loaded. Last but not the least is pre render. It is raised after the page object has created all controls that are required in order to render the page including child controls of the composite controls. The page object raises the pre render event on the page object and then recursively does the same for each child control. The pre render event of the individual controls occurs after the pre render event of the page. It allows final changes to the page or its control and this event takes place before saving view state. So any changes made here are saved. For example, after this event, you cannot change any property of a button or change any view state value. Each data bound control whose data source ID property is set calls its data bind method and use the event to make final changes to the contents of the page or its controls. And then there is random method as well. So this is a method of the page object and its controls and not an event and the random method uh, generates the client side HTML dynamic hypertext markup language which is DHTML and script that are necessary to properly display a control at the browser. Last but not the least we have unload as well. So this event is used for cleanup code after this point all processing has occurred and it is safe to dispose of any of the remaining objects including the page object as well. So the cleanup can be performed on the instances of classes in other words objects 
and then we can perform cleanup on closing open files and closing database connections as well so this event occurs for each control and then for the page as well during the unload stage the page and its controls have been rendered so you cannot make further changes to the response stream and if you attempt to call a method such as response.write method then the page will throw an exception as well so now that we are done with the page life cycle let's move on to the next question that we have which says what is the code to send an email from an asp.net application so following us the code we can use to send an email from an asp.net application so first of all we have a message variable then we use the object for specifying the email addresses and then we mention the subject body as well we use the smtp server to call the host and then we use the smtp mail to send the message as well so this is the basic code you can use to send an email from an asp.net application so let's talk about the next question now which says what are the event handlers that we have for global.as ax file so we have application events and session events for global.as ax file so for session events we have session start and session end but for application events there are a lot more handlers so we start from application start then there is application end after that there is application acquire request state and then authenticate request authorize request begin request disposed end request we have error post request handler execute then there is pre request handler execute after that we have so many like pre send request content and then there is pre send request headers release request state and then we have application resolve request cache after that in the last we have application update request cache so these are the different handlers that we have for global.asax file so let's take a look at the next question now which is explain role based security so what exactly is a role based security it is used to implement security measures based on the role assigned to the users in the organization you can authorize users based on their roles in the organization for example in windows we have role based access like there is user then there is admin and guest as well so this is a simple example of role based security that we can use in our applications as well so the next question is what is cross page posting basically cross page posting means that you are posting form data to another page as opposed to posting form data back to the same page as it is default in asp.net i mean by default buttons and other controls that cause a post back to an asp.net web page submit the page back to itself now cross page posting can be achieved by a post back url property which is causing the post back and then we have a find control method which can be used to get the values that are posted on this page to which the page has been posted so whenever we click on a submit button on a page the data is stored on the same page but if the data is being stored on a different page that is when we call it as a cross page posting so this is all about cross page posting let's talk about the next question which says how we can apply themes to an asp.net application so following is the code to change the theme we open the configuration then we go to system.web we write pages and we mention the theme and after that we close the system.web and configuration so this is a very simple code that we can use to apply themes to an asp.net application so let's take a look at the next question now so the next question is explain passport authentication so what exactly is passport authentication the passport authentication provider uses microsoft passport service to authenticate users the forms authentication provider uses the custom html forms to collect authentication information and lets you use your own logic to authenticate users i mean the users credentials are stored in a cookie for use during the session so this is all about passport authentication so let's take a look at the next question now the next question is what are asp.net security controls so following are the security controls that we have in asp.net which is asp/login which actually provides a login capability that enables the users to enter their credentials then we have login name which allows you to display the name of the logged in user after this we have login status which displays if the user is authenticated or not and then we have login view which provides various login views depending on the template that has been selected and last but not the least we have password recovery which emails the users their lost passwords so this is all about the asp.net security controls let's take a look at the next question the next question is list all the templates of the repeater control 
so the templates for the repeater controls are item template then we have alternating item template there is separator template header template and last but not the least we have a footer template so these are all the templates of the repeater control now that i have listed all the templates of the repeater control let's talk about them one by one so the item template so we use this template for elements that are rendered once per row of data talking about alternating item template we use this template for elements that are rendered every other row of data this allows you to alternate background colors as well now talking about a header template we use this template for elements that you want to render once before you item template section talking about the footer template we use this template for elements that you want to render once after your item template section and last but not least we have a separator template so we use this template for elements to render between each row such as line breaks so this is all about the templates of the repeater control guys let's move on to the next question that we have the next question says what is the app setting sections in the web.config file now if we want to set the user defined values for the whole application we can use the app settings blocks in the web.config file for example the code below will show you how you can use the connection string throughout the project for the database connection so you use the configuration then you go to the app settings add a key connection string then you get the value give it the server as local then you mention the password and database as default close the app settings and em and you're good to go so this is how you can actually use app settings and this is how you can actually use the connection string throughout the project for the database connection so this is what app settings can do in the web.config file so let's take a look at the next question now the next question is what is mime we can call it mime also it actually stands for multipurpose internet mail extensions i mean it is a standard way of classifying the file types on the internet by specifying a mime type application can easily identify the type of file and can extract more information and attributes about a file so this is all about mime guys let's take a look at the next question now so the next question says what is http handler so every request into the asp.net application is handled by a specialized component called http handler I mean it is the most important component for handling ESP.NET applications requests. So it uses different handlers to serve different files. So let's take a look at all those handlers. First of all, we have a page handler which uses the .aspx extension and it handles the web pages. Then we have a user control handler which uses the .ascx extension and handles the web user control pages. Then we have a web service handler which uses the .asmx extension and handles the web service pages and last but not least we have a trace handler which uses the trace.axd extension and it is used to handle trace functionality. So this is all about http handler in .net guys. Let's take a look at the next question now. So the question says what are the different type of cookies in ASP.NET? So first of all we have a session cookie which resides on the client machine for a single session until the user logs out and then we have a persistent key which resides on the user machine for a period specified for its expiry so it may be an hour a month or never it totally depends on the period specified for its expiry so let's take a look at the last question for this session which is difference between an execute scalar and execute non query so execute scalar only returns the value from the first column of the first row of your query and executor reader returns an object that can iterate over an entire result set but execute non query does not return data at all only the number of rows affected by an insert update or delete this brings us to the end of this session guys now that we have come to the end of the session don't forget to subscribe to edureka for more exciting tutorials and also press the bell icon to get the latest updates from edureka thank you I hope you have enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning.